performance computing. My name is Balázs Gerefi. I work at RECAN Center for Computational Science. And we are co-organizing this together with John Charles from Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. Thanks. So, yep. Did you want to say something? Oh, no, I was just saying hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, just a quick agenda for what we wanted to do today. I will first of all go through and give a short introduction for all of our panelists. And then John is going to give a technical overview of disaggregation. Then we will move on to the panel statements where we asked all the panelists to present their vision about this topic and also some of our, uh, try to answer some of our questions. And then we'll go to the discussion and question answer from the audience. And so we are very honored to have uh, a great lineup of speakers. And I would like to introduce each of them uh, in, in a few words. So we have Karen Bergman, who is the Charles Pachel Professor of Electrical Engineering at Columbia University, where she also serves as the Faculty Director of the Columbia Nano Initiative. Professor Bergman received uh, her Master's and PhD from MIT. At Columbia, she leads the Lightwave Research Laboratory, encompassing multiple cross-disciplinary programs at the intersection of computing and photonics. Karen is the recipient of the 2016 IEEE Photonics Engineering Award and is a fellow of the Optical Society of America and IEEE. So we have Mark Fay. Mark is the president, CTO, and co-founder of IR Labs. He holds a PhD from the University of Colorado Boulder and previously held visiting research <coughs> researcher positions at MIT. His work focuses on building new generation of electronic photonics technologies and products that solve key bottlenecks in of high bandwidth data movement. So we have Larry Dennison. Dr. Dennison leads the network research group at NVIDIA. His current research interests uh, include large networks of GPUs, switch microarchitectures, network on chip and photonic interconnect. At NVIDIA, he was the principal investigator for the Design Forward project, which was responsible for several GPU shared memory concepts such as NVSHAM and Nickel. His team proposed <coughs> development of a GPU shared memory fabric, and developed the first NV switch architecture. Larry holds PhD and master's degrees from MIT. We have Takashi Miyoshi from Fujitsu. He's currently the director of Future Society and Technology Unit at Fujitsu. His primary research interest uh, includes server architectures, especially interconnect and IO subsystems <coughs> for heterogeneous computing. He has over 10 years of experience in developing server interconnects and has been leading the research of the resource pool architecture project uh, at Fujitsu Laboratories since 2010. He received his master's from the University of Tokyo. And then finally, we have Satoshi Matsuoka, who is the director of Trikan Center for Computational Science, which is a Japan's top tier HPC center that uh, hosts the Fugaku supercomputer. Previously, he was the leader of the Tsubama series of supercomputers at Tokyo Institute of Technology, where he still holds a professor position. Professor Matsuoko is a fellow of the ACM and the European ISC. He has won many awards, including the GSPS Prize from the Japan Society for Promotion of Science in 2006, the ACM Gordon Bell Prize in 2011, the 2014 Sydney Fernbach Memorial Award, and the HPDC 2080 Achievement Award, and most recently the, the SC Asia 2019 HPC Leadership Award. And with that, I will let uh, John go with the technical intro. All right, thanks there. Uh, so let's get this show on the road. All right, so I'm going to give a brief overview of um, the motivation for resource disaggregation, as well as um, you know some of the opportunities uh, that the other panelists here will dive into more deeply. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, first off, you know, let's look at uh, you know typical data center requirements. This example is more uh, driven by the commercial data centers, but um, you know we're learning how this could also be applied for HPC type workloads. So in a typical uh, data center, you'll have a training uh, uh, node, which is in this case, this is an example from a uh, NVIDIA DGX1, 
where uh, each of the GPUs um, are configured with high bandwidth uh, um, NV links between them uh, so that they can exchange uh, uh, weight gradients. So they can each train independently and then exchange weights to keep to build up the model and keep it consistent as it's uh, to accelerate the training of a, a new model. Um, but when you go from training to inference, suddenly you don't need any of those connections between the neighboring GPUs. You really wanna face all of your bandwidth to the top of rack switch and, uh, and stream data in from the outside world on that uh, trained, uh, uh, trained model. In the case of data mining, you might wanna actually uh, shift all of your bandwidth so you're connecting um, to NVRAM. And so you could imagine a node that has a, a ton of NVRAM packed into it so that you can uh, sift through uh, uh, lots of data uh, to look for patterns. And then lastly, for a graph analytics type workload, uh, your configuration of the node might be to have a whole bunch of high bandwidth memory and uh, in a lot of uh, inter-node uh, connectivity through the top of rack. So these would con constitute four different node configurations and four different systems really to serve each of these four uh, different workloads. Um, and looking at an example from NERSC, um, uh, so this is from Brian Austin from his workload uh, analysis, uh, they observed that uh, for each of the nodes, uh, a large fraction, at least 15% of the workload uses more than 75% of the memory. So building nodes with 128 you know, gigs of memory is justified. But at the same time, 75% of those job hours uh, use less than 25% uh, of the available memory. And so that means a huge amount of memory is in each of the nodes, which is a capital cost, and it's also a power cost, and it's being underutilized. Uh, some need a lot of memory, but uh, a lot of you know, uh, a lot of the jobs don't. And um, so having a one size fit all across all the nodes uh, is, is wasteful. So the notion of uh, you know, our current server architecture, what we do, uh, especially as new accelerators come along like GPUs and then uh, uh, adding uh, solid state storage, we pack all the possible things you could possibly need into each node. And then you replicate and repeat in order to build up a homo homogeneous system. Uh, even though you know, some of these jobs might not want to use the SSD or other jobs might not want to use the you know, GPU or whatnot. Um, uh, but despite that, we put everything, cram everything into every node. In a disaggregated rack, you basically uh, put these resources into pools and then you select out of the pool to compose uh, the kind of node that you need uh, for the job at hand. Um, and there's a, disaggregation is being deployed in practice across many uh, hyperscale data centers, such as Google and Amazon and such. And a lot of them use um, uh, PCIe uh, switches or um, 100 gig ethernet in order to implement the uh, solution. And now this is only one to 10 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. And this is significantly inferior to the DRAM bandwidths, which are 100 to a terabyte per second. Uh, and so, but despite that, resource disaggregation is alive and well and widely deployed because despite that limitation, it offers a huge amount of value to the hyperscale data centers in terms of reducing uh, marooned resources. These are resources that are present in the system but are underutilized. Uh, but there's, there's hope. There's uh, new um, technologies emerging uh, that, that enable us to get past that. And it's, it's this wonderful confluence of uh, technology, packaging technologies and photonic technologies uh, coming together here. So, you know, we uh, have been able to um, overcome the bandwidth limits of traditional DRAM, not by increasing the CERTES rates to get off chip, but in fact, uh, wide and slow solutions, such as these uh, solder micro bumps that you see here or copper micro pillars, where they're able to increase the interconnect density so that each of those pillars or, or solder micro bumps can operate at a relatively slow 10 gigabits per second, uh, but, but wide and slow, we're able to get enormous bandwidth from these high bandwidth memories. Uh, the second is silicon photonics. The magic of silicon photonics is that you can use uh, conventional 
uh, lithography technologies in order to uh, tamp down these uh, rings to encode for each ring a separate frequency of light. And the incremental cost of going from one ring to hundreds of rings is, is fairly uh, low because you're using lithography, silicon standard silicon lithography processes to stamp them down. So again, wide and slow, lots of rings encoding lots of frequencies on each uh, fiber in order to achieve high bandwidth. And then the last is the emergence of these cone laser sources. If we had to put down a discrete laser for each of the frequent 100 frequencies, that would be crazy expensive. Here you can have a single laser source that can generate hundreds of frequencies of light. And Karen and, uh, uh, and Mark will talk more about that. So there's a lot of different technologies available in this space, uh, but it's creating this revolution, whereas we used to have the high bandwidth memories uh, sharing a package with the GPU, for example, here, but there's limited area in that package. And there's also limited reach when you're using uh, electronics to uh, wires to get to those packages. If we can replace the, uh, uh, use that area instead of for the high bandwidth memory, but actually put down photonic system and package that has those laser sources and rings. Now we can, uh, once you go from the electronic to the photonic domain, now we can go long distances without any loss and maintain that bandwidth. Uh, and so there are many te multiple technology options. You're gonna hear more detail about them soon. And the opportunity here is that you could have photonic MCMs uh, for each of the different resources to enable your resource disaggregation, but at terabyte per second bandwidths. Uh, and so now we can actually impedance match, we can speak at high bandwidth memory speeds and have an optical circuit switch that reconfigures uh, to the different system um, uh, configurations. And so here with uh, fairly slow, low radix optical circuit switches, now we can use those switches to configure nodes for training when you need them for training and then reconfigure them for inference using the same pool of resources. All right, so that's all I have to say. Uh, so that's kind of the vision for what we could do with uh, what, what the technologies are, what the motivation, and what we can do with disaggregation for HPC. And now we're going to hear uh, from our panelists. So, Karen is first. Yeah. Karen is first. Okay, great. Sounds good. So you can see my uh, slides well. Yeah. Yeah. Super. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, John and uh, Balaz, for uh, organizing this fantastic panel and for the invitation. Uh, so I'm going to focus, uh, as John mentioned, uh, a little bit deeper onto the uh, technologies uh, and specifically on on the silicon photonic technology. So um, let me just put up this uh, this really um, uh, fantastic plot that was generated. Uh, at, at DARPA by, uh, by the program manager, Gordon Keeler, uh, who started this uh, uh, in the US, this uh, PIPES um, a program, focusing on uh, exactly increasing the, uh, uh, the escape bandwidth density uh, from, from sockets. Um, so uh, what you see here is uh, on, on the kind of the y-axis is a figure of merit that includes the bandwidth density in uh, gigabits per second per millimeter, so the edge bandwidth density uh, uh, and the energy efficiency, the combined metric uh, in, in, in the energy efficiencies in picojoules per bit. And so, um, you know, the electronic interconnects, and these are just some of the DARPA programs that have uh, been implemented, you know, really are, uh, they, they have a, you know, a fantastic uh, both bandwidth uh, density as well as energy uh, efficiency uh, for very, very short uh, interconnects. So this is the x-axis as a function of distance. Um, and, you know, as we know well, uh, as we increase the propagation distance from in package or actually on the chip uh, across the board and off the board, um, the, the electronic uh, uh, interconnect uh, primarily, you know, due to both metrics, bandwidth density and the energy consumption um, is, is diminished. Um, and uh, uh, some of the optical uh, uh, interconnects that we all know, um, you know, from from the InfiniBand and and, and uh, co the commercial in inter data center uh, photonic interconnects that are 100 gigabit, 400, and now even 800 gigabit, really don't focus on. They they certainly propagate over long distances, 
uh, and can have uh, uh, high bandwidth, but they really don't focus on the energy consumption. Um, and so, you know, we have this sort of open space here where uh, we really need to get uh, both, you know, extreme bandwidth densities as well as the energy efficiency sub picojoule per bit, um, as John was uh, showing in his slides, to get this deeper uh, disaggregation that actually is in the uh, you know, hundreds of gigabytes and more like terabytes uh, regime. And so this is where the silicon photonic technology um, uh, has the capability to deliver uh, because of this closed integration with the electronics um, and, and, and the innovations that have been happening in, in the silicon photonics world. So let me just quickly um, sort of summarize at least our approach. Um, uh, in, in, in our work uh, led at Columbia University, um, a really key aspect of our uh, design for these extreme high bandwidth densities. So I'm talking about um, bandwidth per link, per pin of uh, at least a terabit, but uh, we're looking at doing multiple terabits, even per pin. And to get there, um, the really enabling technology is this uh, comb uh, uh, generator uh, laser. So the laser is a single laser that can generate uh, potentially up to hundreds of optical wavelengths. And not only do you need to generate these large number of wavelengths uh, with a single laser, which makes it very energy efficient because the wall plug efficiency of the laser uh, can be made to be very high, um, but you also need to have a significant power per line uh, so that you know, we eliminate the need for optical amplifiers and other, other sorts of uh, uh, devices in the link so that we really uh, can can achieve this uh, uh, low low energy consumption per bit, um, and so we start with this comb. This is a new technology developed at Columbia. It, it's uh, uh, based on uh, what we call the normal dispersion regime um, uh, uh, resonator. I'll show you a little bit more on that. And then we have this uh, link design uh, that includes uh, primarily these uh, micro disk modulator technology fabricated in silicon photonics, as well as uh, micro ring uh, resonator filters uh, to separate out these, uh, these channels. And this is kind of a diagram of um, this, uh, the example of this, this particular design has five terabit uh, per millimeter squared uh, bandwidth density. Uh, so just a little bit more about the comb, what you see here is kind of all these lines. And right now, uh, some of our combs operate in the 15, uh, the 1.5 micron wavelength regime. However, these are extremely flexible and have been shown to operate. We can have them operating in the 1300 regime, which is a more common wavelength for uh, computing interconnects or even uh, shorter wavelengths or even longer wavelengths. Uh, and here uh, you see basically that these lasers are extremely low noise and extremely stable. So these are operating in our very noisy lab over, over hours. Um, and, and so this is kind of the key innovations is that we take the comb directly and can send it uh, through these uh, micro disk modulators and obtain without any error correction, without any additional um, uh, electronics uh, signal conditioning, uh, very good, um, basically error-free operations. So these are 10 to the minus nine, 10 to the minus 12 um, types of bit error rates directly, directly from the comb. So again, this is the architecture. We typically start with this one of these broadband combs. Uh, we might have uh, what we call uh, these uh, interleaver stages just to separate. Uh, when we have hundreds of channels, uh, we may not want to put all the channels on a single bus. So we have the ability to uh, divide them into multiple buses. Uh, and so there's a quite a bit of design space here in, in the, in the uh, link architecture. Um, and so uh, the concept is that um, we can we can have these uh, essentially you know terabit uh, to begin with and two terabit in the near future and multi terabits uh, uh, going forward per per pin uh, uh, included as part of the the IO to the chip directly to the chip and so you see kind of uh, this is uh, our vision that you could have. The, the optical interconnects, you know, directly feed potentially a large bank of high bandwidth memory, uh, GPUs, and other computing resources. So to really allow the deep disaggregation at the point uh, where we have extremely high bandwidths today. 
Um, so we, we, we work very carefully about the link budget. Um, and so this is just one example of our, of our terabit uh, link that we recently uh, completed. Uh, and this particular link, uh, and this, this is including all the, all the uh, energies, including the laser source, including the thermal tuning and so forth, um, uh, were, was able to um, demonstrate uh, 0.5 picojoule per bit. And this, this was particularly um, you know, driven by, by that uh, DARPA program that I mentioned. And we're actually uh, continuing to work on this and even reducing the, the energy per bit even further. We're doing this, uh, just to kind of give a little hint, into making a lot of these devices uh, eight thermal. So they don't even require some of the thermal energies uh, to tune. Uh, so again, uh, just to kind of highlight some of the hardware, uh, this is this is the chip. This is a 32-channel chip that that we had uh, reported on, and you can see here kind of the size. This is packaged, uh, the the modulators and the receivers, and you can see here, you know, really clean eyes directly from the chip. This is without uh, any any amplification, without any conditioning, uh, and this is this is uh, this, these examples. Examples are 10 and 16 gigabit per second. Importantly, they're designed to work uh, directly with uh, the companion electronic chip. In this, in this work, uh, the electronics is designed in TSMC 28 nanometers, and we're currently working on, on a more advanced node um, with, uh, with Intel. Uh, so altogether, uh, this is kind of the packaged uh, product. You see the, the PIC and the, and the EIC are 3D integrated. Uh, in, 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 our, in our technology so that we can really get the extremely high uh, bandwidth densities of, uh, as I indicated, five terabit per millimeter squared. Um, and uh, see a little bit more just to show that uh, this is a, the, fully, the fully packaged device with the fiber array. And uh, just to kind of summarize, uh, again, the, um, uh, the packaging, uh, as John mentioned, you know, this is this is really coming together of uh, the packaging technology and the silicon photonics um, uh, in the ecosystem to be able to achieve this um, this goal of uh, deep disaggregation. And so, I'll 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 end here and uh, leave some of the summary and comments for the panel discussion. Thank you. And next one is Mark. Okay. Um, let's see. Seemed like that didn't come through. Can you let me know if that's coming through? Yeah, we can see it now. Okay, thank you. Um, so, hey, uh, my name is Mark Wade. Um, I'm one of the, uh, the co-founders of IR Labs and, and currently um, serving as the president and CTO. Um, yeah, I'll kind of continue on the theme uh, that, that Karen uh, spoke about in the previous slide. Um, but, I, you know, IR Labs is a, is a startup that's looking to uh, productize some of these technologies. Um, and we've been working on this for a few years and, and we're really kind of um, teed up to uh, deliver our first products into, into systems uh, next year. So, um, you know, this is, these are actually these kind of chiplet, optical IO chiplet technologies are, are making their way into real systems. And I'll talk about some of the, uh, um, the information we've shown publicly on that. Um, I think John did a great job motivating, so I won't spend too much time here, but maybe just um, some, some recent kind of public examples on, on, on showing where some of the companies are trying to build, um, you know, next generation scale out uh, computing systems. Uh, there's a nice presentation by uh, Ganesh at, at, uh, at Tesla AI Day a, a few months ago. And really, uh, the only thing I want to point out here is um, the kind of compute tile that he's holding in his hand. Um, if you look at how much bandwidth uh, uh, they would like to escape from that tile, um, you, have, you have 144 terabits per second of, of transmit and receive coming in and out of that, uh, of that tile. Um, and on the upper right, and I'm, I'm sure we'll hear some more about some of these concepts from Larry, um, uh, you know, there are a variety of companies really thinking about how do you how do you build scale out computing systems and, and so for example nvidia has shown some public information on concepts on on uh, you know rack scale gpus to where you can go compose these these rack scale systems um, and have them behave like a single logical compute uh, system 
Um, and it, this is really enabled by an optical IO technology that can span uh, the distance that you need to, to just span the physical distance between these compute nodes. Um, but to put some actual kind of numbers to highlight the problem as we, as we took, kind of switch into saying, well, why can't we you know, build these systems today? If you just take uh, uh, Tesla's uh, um, kind of training tile here as an example, um, and, you, and you take their raw bandwidth that they want to escape, 144 terabits per second, and you compare it to uh, where some of the, the products on the market exist today, um, uh, which Karen mentioned as well, uh, you know, really those products are at energy efficiencies that are um, far off on, on what they need to be to, to really enable um, uh, a, a power profile to escape these high bandwidths. So, you know, products today in, in the ethernet pluggable world or even the ethernet, uh, some of the uh, concepts that are being looked at to go in package or near package, um, you know, those, those results in kilowatts of power uh, to escape the kind of bandwidth from these, uh, from these training tiles. And we really want to be pushing down, you know, deep into the sub 10 picojoules per bit, ideally kind of five and in, in with a with a roadmap towards uh, one. So that's where we're trying to go. Um, so why can't we do it? Uh, I think multiple people have, have touched on this, so I won't spend too much time here. But but really, it's it's solving the the uh, bandwidth coming out of of the elect, of the electrical I/O pins from compute sockets. Um, and probably this chart on the right uh, um, is the is the Kind of easiest uh, technical chart to look at to say what's what's happening and and why now, um, and it shows uh, uh, it's another DARPA chart that that shows the uh, um, the power growth um, of of total power consumed in computing packages, and then it shows the fraction of that power that's being um, used for off chip I/O, and of course these two lines are on a collision course on somewhere around 2020, which puts us to you know, the problem is hitting in a very serious way uh, right now. Uh, this left chart is the same chart that, that uh, Karen showed. And, and I do, I'm not gonna walk through it again, but I do think I'll, I'll call it out again here. This chart is worth, you know, people kind of looking at and trying to understand because it, it really does. It's a great single chart that kind of contains the entire problem statement. <laughs> and, and as we're considering new solutions and as we're, um, you know, trying to figure this out as a technical community, this is a great chart to, to be keeping in mind and kind of putting our solutions on this map. Uh, but of course the, the motivation, um, as it's already been said, is if we can solve uh, this bandwidth distance problem, and that's really the fundamental problem, then, uh, then we can start to have a way to um, really build uh, these disaggregated systems that can span large distances um, and still move high bandwidths between points uh, in, in those systems. Um, and that gives is kind of a, a key ingredient to uh, uh, being able to disaggregate compute, um, accelerators, uh, memory, storage, um, kind of all of it. So uh, another thing that was mentioned is, is what we're experiencing right now is kind of a, um, you know, a, a confluence of, of advanced packaging technologies uh, um, combined with some of the latest um, advances in silicon photonics. And, and so what that's resulted in is um, the ability to build uh, what we've been calling optical IO chiplets. And what these are is uh, they are uh, single pieces of silicon uh, that are built in a, um, a commercial 300 millimeter uh, CMOS foundry. Um, so it's a production foundry. Um, and uh, we build monolithic chiplets. So we put all the electrical um, kind of uh, uh, parts of the system and the optical devices, except for the laser on single chips. Um, and this then gives us a single chiplet that can intercept uh, where the commercial uh, production world is with advanced packaging. And so then uh, these are uh, on the right here is an actual picture of, of an assembled unit. And I'll show a couple more later. On the left is a rendering of, of, of some of kind of the configurations that we're working on with different customers. But really what you have is you have a platform that, that has some compute um, ASIC in it so, in, or some kind of ASIC, CPU, GPU, FPGA, or some kind of SOC doesn't really matter to us. Um, and then we have optical IO chiplets that get integrated very closely in a, in a two and a half D uh, advanced package. And as John mentioned earlier, uh, we can build these uh, wide uh, um, parallel interfaces between the, the host ASIC and our chip. Um, and that's how we get electrical uh, uh, data in and out of uh, our chip. Um, and then we attach fiber to these chips. So what you have is you have you know, optical connections coming straight from the compute package. So what's the overall architecture look like? And just kind of from a simple point to point view, um, 
Uh, well, here's the kind of cartoon block diagram. Uh, you have a, you have some kind of ASIC. Uh, there's an electrical interface on that on that on that ASIC that talks to our what we call our Terrify CMOS optical I/O chip. Um, we take that electrical I/O into our chip, and then we do the electrical to optical conversion on this chip. Um, it's being fed by uh, an off uh, kind of an, an off package uh, CW light supply, um, and this supplies the the laser light into the Terrify optical I/O chip, and then the Terrify optical I/O chip uses that laser light for encoding data, much in the same way that that Karen spoke about on, uh, in the previous talk. And then we couple into single mode fibers in and out of this chip. So once you're in the single mode fiber, um, you could go tens of centimeters across the same board. You could go, um, you know, a couple of meters in the same rack, uh, or you could go a couple, uh, uh, you know, up to a couple of kilometers um, across a data center to a different pod of racks. So it gives you a kind of single uh, uh, physical architecture here that that can span all of these distances, and it fundamentally breaks the traditional the traditional bandwidth distance trade-off. Um, here's just kind of a couple of snapshots on, on some of what we've shown publicly this year. Uh, we've, we've integrated these triplets into an Intel uh, FPGA platform. So here's an example of having five of our Terrify uh, chiplets. And we've shown uh, you know, one terabit per second per chiplet demonstrations and up to uh, 1.6 terabits per second per chiplet demonstrations. So we did a demonstration um, as part of a DARPA project earlier this year that showed um, five terabits per second of, of actual FPGA to FPGA traffic um, uh, going through our, um, our optical I.O. chiplets. So on the right here is, is what that uh, package looks like. On the left um, is what it looks like with the socket on it and with fibers attached in, an, in a PCIe, uh, um, um, PCIe uh, form factor, a PCIe card. Uh, we've done uh, and kind of published uh, lots of results on where we're at and, and, and kind of, you know, how this uh, production hardware is, is getting integrated into um, a variety of kind of um, um, evaluation kits and, and, uh, and test bed solutions so that uh, um, our customers can kind of kick the tires on it. Here's just an example that, uh, that we ran in our lab, and, and we still have kind of a version of this running in the lab showing the uh, remote light source powering up, um, um, you know, a, a Terrify to Terrify communications with uh, our entire kind of software firmware platform running on, on, on the GUI in the back um, and, uh, you know, bi-directional communication going between. Um, there, here's some data kind of showing that that, you know, that that uh, link actually worked. Uh, we published um, a nice paper at, at OFC um, uh, earlier this year. So, I, you know, uh, go check out that paper if you're interested to see the details. But, but really, the, the point of that paper was um, um, you know, it's, it's working in, in, uh, in, in full capacity. Um, last thing I'll say, and I won't spend a lot of time here, and I, you know, it, there's multiple elements to, to making this optical IO technology a reality. It doesn't stop with just building the chip um, or building the laser. You know, there's a lot of downstream elements um, in the manufacturing supply chain um, and bringing, bringing the packaging together, working with the ecosystem to figure out where and how to standardize um, and and also eventually um, how the application uh, um, how the application kind of software layers are actually taking advantage of this at some point um, and and where at every single kind of element of that stack uh, do we need to start working on on anticipating these technologies so okay with that uh, thanks and looking forward to the the panel so before we move to the next right. talk I just wanted to mention that we are monitoring the question because there are comments in the, in the question uh, box and we will be addressing those in the panel. So please be patient with the questions. And next one is Larry. Okay, so can you guys see this? Yeah, we can hear you, uh, we can see it. Uh oh. Uh, looks like Larry's frozen. Oh. All right. You might want to cut your video, Larry. Yeah, that's probably. It. Oh boy. 
réduit là aussi, ma gamme. Ah, ouais. <rire> Oh boy, I think we lost Larry. Okay, maybe we should just. Uh, oh, you the... see, uh, oh, no, here he is. Yeah, okay. Zoom, Zoom just crashed on me. So let me try okay. one more time. Okay. No idea why. Okay. Oh, yeah, it's much better this time. Okay, thank you. Let's try it again. Slideshow mode. Okay, can you see? Yeah, we're just there. There it okay. is. Good. Okay. Um, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about the upper layer systems design and things like that. Um, wholeheartedly agree with John's statement that we have some stranded resources in the system. They appear everywhere in AI, HPC. Uh, also agree with Karen and Mark uh, that we are heading towards you know optically integrated or Really optically integrated systems. The question is, as a systems person, kind of a networking person, uh, where do I apply the technology and to address that problem of resource disaggregation? If we look inside NVIDIA, and we've got our AI data centers, and for the scale out jobs, the very large training jobs in production, we're using Slurm and containers. Um, so that's our, our scale out system here, uh, but it's all container based. Um, for other things, say in the research area, it's also containers, but it's also within Kubernetes for very small systems. Uh, for HPC scale outs uh, that we're looking at evaluation, again, there's a job schedule or Slurm and usually uh, either bare iron or containers, but we have some common components there. Uh, what we do see, as John mentioned, we have these very non-uniform resource resource requirements for job in the AI space, whether we're doing natural language processing or recommenders or graph processing and or security processing. Um, but these also have some very non-uniform business value for job that we need to pay attention to. What's going on? Um, when we look inside, one of the questions John had not spoken to was how on earth do you figure out the resources required to run a job? Uh, it's always one of those sticky questions. That's why I was pointing back to containers and saying we're getting a glimmering there uh, that container specifications can help guide us about the resource requirements on a job. Uh, you know, you do a Docker run dash help and you get these enormous number of options, including how much memory do you want? How much kernel, uh, kernel memory do you want? How many GPUs, the types of GPUs, et cetera. But we're getting to the point where we have a common specification of the resource requirements on a job to be run, yay. Um, and we're also seeing that in even our own data centers here, we've got some customized Slurm that's paying attention to those requirements when we're doing job placement. So, you know, most of our jobs at the very high end, they're running on DGX2 servers, um, the uh, 8X A100s. And for large training jobs, we just don't have enough hardware. We can't build it fast enough, can't deploy it fast enough to keep it up with internal demand. And in addition to all the usual power and energy things, we're trying to accelerate deployment capacity. So just keep that in mind. Okay. John mentioned looking at GPUs as a disaggregated resource. Um, part of our job in research is to always ask ourselves the question, okay, John drew a picture with the disaggregation points being say memory and or GPUs. What do we see? We see certainly for our research workloads where a person is running a single container um, in sort of a Kubernetes cluster, it's a small job. So all they're usually asking for is perhaps a GPU. This might be for an inference job. They really don't care about the rest of the scale out things and we have some attached memory. Okay, maybe we want to um, add some more memory to that GPU. But the disaggregation interface is going to be northbound out of the GPU, i.e. PCIe, CXL, or something. However, a lot of our jobs are training oriented and they're asking for scale out. And they're asking for several GPUs, but they're also asking for NVLink, NVLink connectivity to other GPUs that they're asking for. So this comprises the equivalent of a DGX2 box. And if we try to do disaggregation only on the northbound side, um, we're really stuck uh, disaggregating resources within a very tight cluster, i.e. the ones that are NVLink connected. 
Ideally, we could extend the reach of the NVLink connected domains, but we're trying to understand where we insert the disaggregation points there for slicing. Um, however, as we get into scale out systems, we're left with this sort of third category of things where people are asking for very large numbers of DGX2 boxes um, in a scale out way. But the next piece of connectivity that concerns us is really the infinite band connectivity. Within a TGX superpod, we provide multiple rails of IB, typically in the range of 200 gig and looking ahead to 400 gig per GPU for scale out solutions. Um, so when people are requesting things at that level, they're requesting not only memory capacity, but they're asking for it in the context of some additional network capacity that has to be adhered to in order to enable the scale out. So that's gonna constrain where we can find some of the resources. Um, if you've got memory somewhere else in the system or, or approximate nearby, we have to see what's going to be happening. So when we take a look at the uh, disaggregated memory on the GPU, it sounds good. You know, let's take some memory off of our processing block because GPUs are really good at tolerating latency. The problem is we have very high bandwidth coming out of a GPU. Uh, every generation of GPUs, we drive to increase the bandwidth to the local HBM stacks. The, interesting thing about the way GPUs access memory is interleaved. That is one large block of memory. It is not uh, sliced in any way, shape, or form. And this is to provide aggregate memory bandwidth into the GPU. It makes it a little more problematic, and we have to pay attention to that. So if you're going to share GPU memory, it's kind of an all or nothing. You can't really do partial HBM bandwidth. You have to supply full HBM bandwidth to a fraction of the memory capacity. The other interesting thing that's happening in the DGXA100 systems is that the NVLink memory interface is not a memory interface, a pure, as we understood it to be, memory interface. Um, in this generation, we've added some address translation and protection to the remote GPU. Uh, why, uh, if we're running um, any sort of resource sharing or things over here, but more importantly, what we see is we're doing scale out uh, shared memory spaces as we're adding more memory capacity into our nodes, we're getting um, address space pressure on things that aren't memory, they're in the translation structures. So we've uh, broken apart our translation to a couple pieces, one is source side, the other one is remote side. So one of our issues here as we add more, you know, this aggregated memory to our system, what additional services are required on the far side to enable it? Because we don't want to apply pressure on the source side as we're adding memory capacity. The other thing is we're really concerned about things like memory pinning, uh, what accessible memory regions are there. Uh, coming in with a raw memory interface might not be the right answer. The other thing that's happening concurrently, everything's always a moving part. Um, so you know, John has been working on uh, alternatives to you know, shared memory program. Uh, we have a traditional shared memory style, uh, you know, atomic reads and writes for an asynchronous Jacobi solver. One observation here is, okay, that's exposing memory as a resource. If we've got a very large um, problem we're solving, yes, we want some memory. But are the programming models going to change out from underneath us where we're not really accessing memory, but we're really dealing with more active message programming? So this is another area when we look at resource disaggregation saying, oh, wait, let's stop and think about how we're exposing the additional capacity. So on the right-hand side, we're showing a message queued system, very small messages. Um, they wanna do things like eight byte writes at this level. Well, this is gonna bollocks up uh, if anything that's doing you know, very broad HBM style memory, we'd like to understand what these addressing patterns look like as we're accessing remote resources. Um, the nice thing about these is, however, is going back to something John commented earlier on access latency. Uh, the Schmem programs have things like these atomics in them, depends on whether the memory system has them implemented natively. A raw HBM system will not, you're going across the memory HBM bus to implement your atomics on the processing element. Here we're saying, okay, we can do some asynchronous processing and open it up and perhaps allow additional latency while accessing the memory system. Again, the programming system may help uh, us guide solutions for disaggregation. Uh, another example of that is conveyors. Um, you know, we're writing these as um, you know, 
atomic or Schmem operations on the left-hand side, we convert them into an asynchronous push that's latency insensitive. We just push data, we then pull data sometime later. We do a very small memory operation. We bump a location of memory by one in an eight byte operation. The data tends to be highly random here. Um, this is giving application speed up for certain scientific applications. We think this will come into play for AI scale out, particularly for model parallelism scale out um, as we get deeper in there. But again, we're looking at alternatives in memory access models. Puts and takes, um, we're seeing these emerge, might help some memory latency, uh, but you have to have more memory operations. Like how do we expose the asynchronously? Uh, data sizes might be small, uh, so we have to do something about that. Addresses are highly likely to be random. Again, when we're looking at the disaggregation, it might not be the most efficient way to expose an HBM style interface. Alternative that we're exploring, we don't know if it's the right answer or the wrong answer, looking at sort of services oriented interfaces. Um, partly what we have to do in scale out systems these days, particularly uh, um, real deployments, uh, commercial deployments, is we have to implement things like uh, confidential compute. How do we stick that over an HPM style interface with switches and whatnot, the C distribution, and whatnot? So again, looking here and saying, what are we likely to see? We're likely to expose some disaggregated resources over that high bandwidth optical connection, but it's not direct to memory. There's probably an interposer layer there for some sort of uh, service interface that does lightweight processing and does the gearbox shifting between the bandwidth on the optical side, and what's being exposed to us on the memory system. Other trend that we're seeing is 3D stacking um, of things. Everybody wants to 3D stack everything. Uh, so if we were to take a processor uh, design that is highly multi-core, say 128 cores or 256 cores, those cores are arranged in a tile and very nice and neat and there's local caches. If you're doing direct memory stacking over the top of your processing block, um, you're no longer, there's no longer a memory interface that's recognizable. We're doing this in order to get very high bandwidth interconnected vertically into the memory stack, but the interfaces that would be interconnected optically aren't on the memory. They're coming in a network interface, accessing the NOC, and highly likely going to a service processor that's near that vertically stacked memory. So we're looking at these as architectural alternatives, uh, not to you know, dissuade us from doing resource disaggregation, but we're trying to understand what forms it might take in actual deployment. So just some food for thought. And with that, that's the end of my uh, brief intro. Yeah. Okay, I'll stop sharing. And the next one is Satoshi Matsuoka. Are you there? Oh, looks like he is going to be alive. <laughs> yeah, now do you hear me? You yeah, guys? we can hear you now. Oh, yeah. Ex yep. Excellent. Uh, I don't know how the camera works. Um, and let's see if I can put up the slides. I, have a, I only have an iPad right now. So let's see um, if I can um, present my slides from iPad. Oh, thank you. Well, it doesn't show my, uh, I have the PowerPoint on. Let's see, let me try one more thing. Okay.
Do you guys see any? Do you guys see anything? No. You guys? Do you guys see no. PowerPoint? No. We, the case but I think your we, we might not be able to see it. Actually, it probably should show on the screen in the room, right? Okay. Why don't I do this? Okay, I'll do it the analog way. Okay. How's that? Okay. This is <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I think this is the only workable solution for the moment. Well, well, you could send your slide to us and we, we yeah. will share it. Yeah, but I don't think there's a credible way of sharing. Or we can switch turns and uh, why don't I give a presentation next while I send you the slide, try to send you the slide. Yeah, let's, let's, let's do that. Yeah. Perhaps we can have Takashi, that, yeah. Takashi speak next. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'll speak next and uh, in, in the meantime, I'll send you the slide. Okay, sorry for the confusion. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, okay. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Takashi Miyoshi from Fujitsu. Uh, I'm a sub architect and working on a future data set project uh, targeting around 2030. I talk about design computing from the viewpoint of data center that supports APC and AI. As a data center around uh, 2030, uh, power budgeting will be a severe issue. Uh, power consumption of data center will increase by 16 times, so the pressure to power expense is a major concern. Also, due to the end of the uh, law, many kinds of accelerators will emerge. Heterogeneous computing will be a more general platform. The challenge here is how efficiently we can use limited computing resources and how we can provide platform to easily handle advanced accelerators. I think that uh, this area to computing will be a viable solution. Current data center architecture uses a server node as a building block uh, that contain predefined resources such as CPU, GPU, and storage. In contrast, uh, decided computing creates hardware component pools connected via high-speed interconnect. That enables uh, flexible uh, resource assignment and resource allocation beyond physical constraints, uh, that's a server box. Um, benefits of decided computing include uh, many aspects. I pick up uh, three values here. First one is uh, power efficiency, performance per watt. When uh, workload is given by user, uh, optimal server configuration for that workload can be constructed. This leads to better performance with given resources. Second benefit is agility to deploy unique server configuration. In the center figure, uh, when workload A completes and uh, workload B is going to be submitted, server configuration should be updated as quick as possible. This will impact to the overall data center performance and availability. And last one is sustainability. Workload requirements or changes over the time. Uh, there will also be uh, new devices that didn't exist when the system was introduced. It's important to follow this change. Uh, I think this suggestion helps here. Yeah. Implementation of uh, disaggregation is uh, classified into three types, uh, braille type, uh, switch-based, and smartnik based in case of HPC, switch type will be chosen due to low latency and high bandwidth requirements. PCI Express are currently used as a switch, and CXL will be a good candidate to support 
a coherent memory access between CPU and devices. That will reduce data copy overhead. Independent of those dissertation methods, we have several common issues here. Uh, first one is uh, memory pool support is still a big challenge for us and in terms of latency, bandwidth, and uh, also numeric uh, application support. And uh, we need standard software platform to support disaggregated architecture. And automation of server composition is mandatory to realize uh, cloud-like operations. By adopting uh, disaggregated computing to HPC and AI platform, we obtain certain benefits. Uh, introducing heterogeneous computing will become uh, very simple with uh, domain-specific accelerators. In future, uh, we'll be able to handle large memory space to solve IO bottleneck issues. Compared to a uh, cloud platform, APC AI has two unique features. Demand of advanced accelerators is uh, strong. So the platform should be able to handle them. And workload characteristic is defined from that in a data center. HPC job has expected start and completion timing, so we can update uh, system configuration in sync. So yeah. HPC and disaggregated computing will uh, go away together. Um, yeah. In terms of software, we still have many challenge, challenges to be solved. For example, we need uh, easy to understand offering menus of uh, resources to users, uh, while a uh, combination of resources is uh, explosive. Uh, uh, second, a uh, new abstraction layer called logical server will be introduced. Um, management software should support uh, interaction with this new layer, uh, such as uh, logical server deployment operations and uh, device attachment operations, uh, and so on. Dynamic server resource uh, addition and removal is also challenging um, because uh, many applications don't expect server configuration to change while they are running. Also, uh, we want to suggest uh, optimal server configuration once the workload is given. Uh, it might be a most difficult one to achieve. Uh, in order to spread uh, this technology, uh, we need to think about three country uh, missing items. Uh, first one is uh, standardized hardware abstraction layer and API. Uh, they must be defined so that we can accelerate ecosystem uh, growth and that will lower adoption costs. And specific use cases and quantitative effects of uh, described computing should be widely shared among the industry. The benefit of described computing uh, varies uh, case by case, so we need to prove it. Uh, those activities lower the uh, investment hurdles. And first efforts to achieve a uh, more efficient platform is mandatory. For example, uh, common software platforms that support uh, dynamic server configuration, uh, configuration changes, and automated operations. Lack of these items may delay adoption of decided computing. So uh, everyone involved should uh, work together. Uh, in summary, uh, decided compute can be an uh, effective uh, tool for HPC AI from a set of heterogeneous computing. New hardware technology, including uh, accelerators and uh, interconnect, can uh, boost this move. Uh, however, uh, industry wide ecosystem building is essential to make uh, this architecture widely spread. 
So uh, let's overcome those challenges and uh, make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm trying to open the slides from Are you successful? I got the file. Yeah, good. How will we ever survive the pandemic without the internet? Yeah. Okay, let's switch. Yeah, you don't have to change the title. I thought, I forgot to change the title of the slides, but uh, that's not relevant. I, so, I, I changed it. Yeah, can you show the second slide, please? Okay. Is it visible? Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, so I'm Satoshi. Um, I'm director of Recon RCCS, and uh, I'm going to, uh, you know, uh, this is. So people talked about uh, piecewise, piecewise technologies, uh, and also some assistant features. And uh, I'm going to talk about, um, you know, uh, the fastest machine right now um, by various metrics. Uh, but uh, we have, we do have some existing dis disaggreg disaggregation features already embedded in it because it's a new system compared to conventional systems, just like, you know, you can design uh, GPUs from ground up. Uh, the SQRFX actually was designed uh, ground up, and as a result, we were able to add some disaggregation features. And, um, uh, and the most important part is that the system has about five petabytes of memory in total, and these are all high bandwidth memory. There are six, uh, 640,000 HGM2 modules uh, in the entire system, uh, which constitutes, again, constitutes to be about five petabytes. Now, um, so uh, in traditional clusters, these would not only be accessible through some, you know, uh, some NICs, through IO interface, through some, some sort of, um, like MP, uh, some sort of messaging interfaces like MPI. Um, while most of Fugaku is, uh, uh, programming on Fugaku is done that way, you know, use big MPI. The underlying feature of Fugaku as a hardware, um, basically, uh, you can access any memory of any system through RDMA. Um, and in fact, in a very, with very low latency. So, um, so this means that the disaggregate, uh, you know, a lot of people in, most people in data center space think that disaggregation is means to, um, basically to increase resource utilization, basically to try to deal with these resources which are, which will become vacant. And, and by disaggregation, try to, you know, uh, uh, increase the resource utilization, remove the inefficiency. But in Fugaku's case, it's not that. It's to, uh, and it's somewhat similar to GPUs actually. Um, the disaggregation feature is there to increase efficiency. See, that's the part that's different uh, in the HPC space. So can you go to the next slide, please? Does it work? Yeah. Okay, so, so as, a, you know, as a processor, um, you can see here that uh, it's a, a square FX is a mini core ARM CPU with, uh, with vector acceleration features and also memory acceleration feature in particular having uh, the first and still the only CP, general purpose CPU to have HBM2. Um, but if you look, and that's usually what people pay attention to. But when you look inside, can you go next slide, please? Um, in the middle, so the first part's fairly relevant. Uh, the second and third part says we have embedded switching and we have embedded network and embedded switch in a chip. So it's not even SOC, it's in the silicon. So, uh, and, and, and it's and in fact, it's an inherent part of the overall architecture. 
And this allows us to have direct access and direct transfer of memory, uh, memory from one part of the system to the other. In fact, from memory, uh, arbitrary memory, to arbitrary, let's say, L2 cache of any node in the system via RDMA. And because we have 160,000 nodes, well, 100, and that constitutes to be 160,000 network ports, 1.6 million network ports, we have a very, very large system whereby, uh, you know, it's a, Fugaku is a very network heavy system, and thereby we can make use of these disaggregation features. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So if you look at the Fugaku chip, the ASIC4FX chip, um, on the top upper segment, you'll see the TOFUD interface, the proprietary network um, that um, uh, Fugaku has. And uh, like, so let's say the MVLink, uh, this allows direct connection of Fugaku, uh, the ASIC4FX, uh, uh, with any other ASIC4FX chip in the system. Uh, there are some differences, though, compared to MVLink. Uh, MVLink uh, basically only scales to 1632 nodes, and beyond 16 nodes, and beyond that, you need a switch chip. Here, uh, the switch chip is integrated just like Bluejing, Bluejing Q. Uh, the switch chip is also integrated uh, onto the die, and since it's a multi-dimensional torus, it scales almost infinitely. So that's why Fugaku is 160,000 nodes. Not many people question me about the network, but there. Uh, like how many, how many you know, big switches do you have in the system? But actually, there are no big switches in the system except for the small segment where we have InfiniBand 4 IO. For the, most, for the communication, just like we're using Q, we have no switch, or rather the switch is embedded um, into, uh, onto the die. And also the network and the, uh, the, the, the DMA controllers and are also embedded to die. And also, and of course, being embedded, the, the network Interfaces come, the files come out directly from the chip. And it's not integrated optics yet, unfortunately, but combining AOC, um, copper and SM, but significant AOC, there are 100,000 AOC cables in the system. The average con power consumption of the, uh, of the, of the uh, network portion is rather small. It's compared to, let's say, InfiniBand or Ethernet, or even 100G Ethernet, where you can, you know, the NIC can be. Um, even if it excludes a switch, it can be like 30, 30 watts, 40 watts in some cases. Um, the, all the power consumption, including AOC, including switch, including you know, cabling, everything, all the, uh, not just on the cons power consumption on die, but power, con power consumption of everything, if you average out over the chip, is, is only about 8 to 9 watts, so which is about 1, you know, 5 percent of the entire consumption of the machine. And you get, and the bandwidth you get is about 400 gigabits. So it's about, four, or four, about 40 gigabytes per second. So it's a 400 gigabit class network. So, and, and moreover, because as you see, it's integrated into the die. Uh, can you go to the next, uh, next, next slide, please? Okay, well, before that, I'll show you the numbers. Uh, then, uh, so the latency between the closest latency, uh, the shortest latency we have between the nodes is about half a microsecond, which is about the latency um, you have uh, for, let's say, uh, GPU memory access. Uh, or CPU, of course, it's much slower than CPU memory access, but somewhat comparable, maybe an order of magnitude. So, uh, so you know, it's, it's fairly fast. Um, and, but of course, uh, Fugaku being designed as 60 torus, when you have very large jobs, it has to be throughput. It's because more of a throughput network because you have to go through many hops. But when you have a smaller job, let's say like 100 nodes or even like 1,000 nodes, when you have smaller jobs like that, then of course the overall hop count becomes small and the switch latency, of course, is not that big. So you still get the sub-microsecond latency access um, to in a, the nearby memory of your system. And also the bandwidth is about 40 gigabytes. But more, most more importantly, if we go to the next slide. Um, so, so this is the internal internal configuration, the chip is composed of what are called uh, four CMGs. And each CMG has 13 cores, which, and also, which are crossbar connected to each other, and also crossbar connected to the L2. And from the L2, uh, it connects to the internal ring bus, um, which has, you know, fairly high, high bandwidth. 
But you, you also see that the uh, Tofu network controller is directly connected to the, uh, and also the associated uh, TAN DMAX are directly connected to the, the ring bus. Uh, so this means that it allows um, the, any memory in the system to be accessed through this mechanism uh, to be transferred by RDMA. Uh, but in, in fact, because the, RDMA, the DMAC engines are directly connected to, uh, to the switch fabric, which is directly connected to the L2 cache, you can do stuff like cache injection. So, so this means that any, any memory, uh, you can't do L1, unfortunately, but any memory in any of this five petabyte, any, uh, any addressable memory within this five petabyte region of HBM2 can be accessed uh, without CPU intervention. Um, of course, you have to set it up, but once you set it up, without CPU intervention can be transferred through the, the 160,000 L fabric and then uh, injected into the L2 cache. And that's why we get very low latency on the MPI and thus very high performance on many Fugaku applications. So, so, this, so this aggregation is used to basically increase performance and the architecture of, this, of, the, of, the, of the system is, well, it's architect that way uh, to achieve low latency. And this aggregation, in this case uh, of memory versus uh, the memory, uh, overall memory, uh, the fabric versus the CPU really helps in this regard. Next slide, please. So of course, you know, uh, compared to standard data center aggregation, um, it's, a, it's a little different. Uh, so there are some halves um, we have, and I'm trying to see the halves guys wrote it up fairly quickly. So if you'll excuse me. I can't, I can't look at my own slides, so. Well, so. Okay, so, so, I'm sorry. So we do, we have, we, we do have the uh, features that I have described. Very low latency energy uh, which could potentially be enhanced by some of the um, uh, silicon photonics technology in the future architectures. Uh, we can move memory around, move data and memory around at will. Um, and there's no IOPath intervention. So uh, we don't have direct load store, unfortunately, like uh, you have a CXL or MVLink or so forth. Um, and that's something, in some cases, uh, maybe a desirable feature. Uh, not for the application for Fugaku is intended, but st uh, so something like uh, shared memory has to be invented uh, with the RDMA underneath. Uh, there's no coherency, of course, um, so coherency is only within the chip. Uh, and, and there's, uh, most, more importantly, which hasn't been touched upon uh, in this panel, is security. Uh, so I talk a lot with uh, Thorsten Hoffer during this um, uh, SC. One thing he said, uh, uh, like CXL is regarded as one of the, the key interface and protocol for this aggregation, but the security for CXL is, is fine for local in interactions, but when it extended to this, this aggregation, it's quite problematic in terms of the overhead because there are multiple encryption, decryption going on. So uh, we have to, and Fugaku, we don't even have, no, encryption, but in cloud space, when you have a disaggregated resource, you really want to have encryption uh, or security in between. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, you really want end-to-end. -end. But how do, you, how do you make that coexist with those store type of uh, uh, operations uh, with low latency will be a big, a big issue. And of course, I forgot, unfortunately, we, I mean, we do have software support in terms of like MPI and open Schumann, for example, you, that you can sit on top of MPI or some verbs like interface we also provide very similar to um, uh, InfiniBand. Uh, but, you know, uh, but for enterprise applications that, are, that require even more, I would say, transparent disaggregation, uh, we don't have, we don't have that. Like, you know, we don't have totally transparent distribution share, maybe like some of some other systems. So, uh, so, but the point here is, my overall point here is that this aggregation 
if architected properly, can be something not just for resource utilization or dealing with heterogeneity and so forth, but can be a weaponry to increase performance, and that's what Hogaku has done. And probably as the, as the technology advances, all the photonic stuff, a lot of the 3D packaging stuff, all those things come into play, uh, we really should think about how we would uh, combine those with desegregation to increase our performance rather than to th think as a compromise. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, sounds like we have a lot of questions keyed up from the audience, and so maybe we'll just go straight to audience questions. Yeah, I think that's what we should do. I I try to like group them together, some okay. of them that are uh, that are related. So maybe we can start with a few related to the photonics, and it's probably for Mark and Karen. So questions such as. Is silicon photonics the fusion of computing world? I.e. is massive potential, but it's always just on the horizon. <laughs> and what, then will silicon photonics be available affordably? <laughs> These two first, maybe? Sure, I'll, I'll start and I'm sure, I'm sure uh, Mark and others will have comments, but yes, it really is, uh, you know, it, it has been like that for, for a number of years. And I think that we can say like, yes, now, really, really now it's the time. <laughs> uh, so so it, it's very, it's always very difficult to transition to, to new technologies. And this is really a fundamentally new technology. Um, and uh, so a couple of things have been going on in, in the last uh, short number of years, like the last two or three years. Uh, one very important one is um, the, the really the wider availability of foundry-based silicon photonic fabrication around the world. Uh, so in the US, um, we have the foundry that, that my group uses in Albany, New York, there's global foundries uh, and others, uh, Tower Jazz and so forth. And around the world, um, uh, you know, in Singapore and Europe and IMAC um, and, and perhaps even TSMC is coming online. Um, on that, and and so so this is this is huge uh, in terms of being able to really design you know system scale manufacturing scale chips. Um, the the second, which is still I would say challenging, um, is the packaging, the assembly and packaging. So there's just a huge challenge in the assembly and packaging of uh, photonics with the um, uh, with the with the EICs. Um, uh, on, on both on the digital as well as the analog side. Um, and uh, those, uh, the main challenge right now is that there are just multiple solutions. There, there's little, very little on the standards, although there are standards that are um, emerging. Uh, for example, Intel and the AIB interface is, is one that I think will, um, will be important. I'm sure there, there are many others that folks here will, will discuss. Um, but I, I think that kind of the next investment, the next really concentrated uh, effort is going to be on, on really building out the, the assembly packaging ecosystem so that we have um, you know, a larger scale on that. And, and I guess one last uh, component that is uh, challenging is, um, is the laser source, uh, laser sources. Uh, so there are multiple approaches. I showed you um, ours, which I think is very scalable, you know, using a comb uh, laser source, um, but there are others that are being developed uh, both on chip and off chip. Uh, so, so yeah, it, it's still, there is some, some ways to go, but I think that there's uh, a lot more, um, you know, sort of the large vendors as well as uh, smaller vendors that are uh, really, really focusing hard on this. Yeah, and I, I would just add, um, you know, I, I think you covered it really well, Karen. So um, the only thing I would add is uh, silicon photonics has already experienced significant success in the Ethernet pluggable transceiver market in 100 gig and for in kind of, you know, 400 gig coming on the market. So, um, you know, silicon photonics is already here. And, and as Karen listed off, it, you can see it in, in the amount of manufacturers who are who are producing silicon photonics wafers, um, both in the research space and in the production space. Um, and certainly, one of the key things that, that we work on a lot is um, is you know what it, what the downstream supply chain after that looks like because there there are certain key spots that that are that are not uh, uh, well established yet and and um, 
um, in, and it's mostly in the packaging, uh, both the chip assemblies, the, the advanced kind of multi-chip packaging, which tends to be proprietary and hard to access, um, uh, as well as, as getting fibers in and out of that package. So I agree with a lot of what Karen said. Okay, so related questions uh, to probably again, Mark and Karen. So how about communication latency between pools of resources? How do optical interconnects compare to copper in latency concerns? And uh, what are the latency properties of this wide and slow interconnects? And finally, do you see copper for communication of getting small and then optical for uh, bandwidth intensive uh, communication? Yeah, I'll, I'll start off and I, I think, uh, I would imagine Larry also might have some comments here, but, um, <laughs> Uh, you know, just in, in terms of time of flight, you know, latency, uh, it, it's, uh, there really isn't a huge uh, difference in, in quote unquote speed um, between the electrons and the photons. Uh, so this, this is really not where the, uh, the latency gains are, are to be had. Um, the, the, main thing, the main thing with photonics is that you can, you can have direct uh, transparent connections of potentially very, very high bandwidth. Um, and so you might be able to sort of skip, uh, you know, multiple nodes within within your net network and just make, you know, direct connections because you have the ability to to transfer the, this high bandwidth across uh, system wide types of distances. Uh, and and uh, so, so, but then you know we have to be careful because um, you know once you open up the the hierarchical architecture um, with photonics. Um, and are communicating this potentially this aggregated vision that we put forward, uh, uh, then the latency becomes that even the time of flight uh, can become um, important uh, in terms of how many actual cycles does it does it correspond to. You know, there are some additional latencies, especially for um, more the more conventional data centers uh, associated with uh, with the NIC, with the interface, and, and the protocol conversion, all of that, but. Um, assuming that we can design that out uh, in high-performance systems, um, you know, it's, there isn't any additional late, really important latency to consider on the conversion between the electronic photonic planes. That's very, very small. Yeah, I, I think I think that touched on it well. You know, the key thing is that you're moving the electrical to optical conversion as close to the source of the high bandwidth as possible, and then the optics breaks. Uh, the traditional bandwidth distance trade-off. So the, the complexity of the link from point A to point B over large distances is much, much, much simpler. So that's where uh, in, in kind of, you know, what, what Karen said, where you can skip some of these hierarchies of, of how you tend to traverse uh, long distances. Um, you know, and you, you have the photonics channel offers you a much cleaner signaling channel uh, to communicate over um, so you can avoid some of the um, some of the signal processing that that can happen in, um, 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 you know, correcting for for bit errors in in kind of a low bit error rate or I'm sorry high bit error rate uh, um, links. So there's some benefits there as well. Okay, moving up on the the abstraction of the questions. So maybe something for Larry and Takashi. How do we schedule and orchestrate disaggregated resources in future large scale systems? What needs to change in the system software stack? And then another related, if one were switching the node configuration from one, let's say from the training to the inference, how exactly do you recompose? Okay, uh, let's see. So, so I was trying to touch upon, um, and one of the outstanding questions is understanding, number one, characterization of the jobs. Um, people today write software, they deploy them, um, and the operator or the operator of the data center has very little insight as to the requirements of the job. As I mentioned, um, starting to see that change a bit with the containers interface is sort of a uniform abstraction for what I'm going to be running on the job. Um, so certainly that will help, but um, then we also need resource aware schedulers, and that's a more complicated subject. Um, we are starting to pay attention to it, but as um, well, Satoshi spoke to at the end, we're also then trying to understand how we access those disaggregated resources. So there's differences uh, emerging here about are we exposing you know a raw shared or raw memory interface 
um, in effect, where it's bound to a single processing element uh, where you can supply security, but it's a point to point connection versus to what degree are these disaggregated resources shareable or accessed by multiple you know, clients of the device. Um, we're still not sure on those things. So we see that we have to solve, number one, how do we specify resources, indicate um, you know, how they're about to be used, how they can be borrowed, if you will, uh, deal with security there, uh, deal with partitioning and reconfiguration. And also there's this macro thing about the programming models that are still hanging out there. Uh, can I say something? This is Oshi here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, some of the simpler tax um, instances of disaggregation and resource allocation thereof are, uh, you know, are s simple and actually already being practiced. You know, there are a lot of instances of this in the cloud. And also, like even on supercomputers, you know, uh, aside from Fugaku, uh, Tsubame 3 and uh, ABCI uh, supercomputer that was, you know, I designed and I was heavily involved in. Basically, there were GPU machines that have whole, you know, four, GP, four you know, lots of GPUs in single node plus CPUs. But actually, uh, we were able to partition these uh, dynamically um, when we allocated, um, allocated the resources. Uh, let's say you need, uh, I need two GPUs and five, uh, six G CPU cores each. Well, we modified the scheduler and a container or uh, virtual machine that differed on ABC and Tsubame, uh, but basically, we use uh, these kinds of uh, uh, abstractions and features to encapsulate these resources as if they were uh, uh, sort of physical nodes. And then they were given to users and jobs were co-located uh, to maximize the resource utilization. So you know, simple, uh, so fairly simple things like that are possible. What's difficult, I think has been alluded is, uh, for example, um, how, do you, you know, how do you gather resources um, when they're distributed? Uh, in fact, uh, and how do you cope with the changes as, you know, uh, even in a large system, even a small system, but particularly a large system, you know, there will be constant changes in the way the resources are allocated because, you know, the jobs come and go all the time, they crash and uh, they need to recover. And in some cases they need uh, much uh, real-time allocations and so forth. So, and then what, what, what do you do? Do you have static allocation? Uh, do you have static allocation? Or do you go to more advanced, uh, systems where you can you know, move the resources around. Let's say you take this memory, um, you know, just like you migrate jobs, you can migrate memory from this portion of the machine to the other portion of the machine to make it closer, despite the fact logically that they're dis dis disaggregated, but to enhance performance. And, uh, but then, you know, that becomes a really difficult situation when you want cont continuation of jobs and also you want to respect things like security. If you combine security and I.O. Uh, on top of this, it becomes a really difficult task, and I don't think there are any existing systems to do that. Having said that, I think it's p possible because uh, all these are conceivably done. We, we, we would know the mechanism to do it. There would be automated ways of doing resource allocations. Uh, we've done, always done automated resource allocations and more with uh, like things like artificial intelligence on hand. We can do much more effective resource alloca allocations, um, you know, because of course, there are NPR problems, but uh, but uh, with AI, we may be able to come to a, a very uh, as a very good heuristics. So, um, I, uh, so I anticipate with advances in hardware, um, we can really expect these uh, disaggregate disaggregate systems to really optimize themselves to the best configuration of uh, of each each uh, task, and optimize the entire system to to get get the best throughput for the whole system. Okay. Uh, answer problem is uh, uh, who defines the uh, uh, server configuration. In a small system, uh, it's very clear. Uh, user uh, specifies uh, what uh, they want to use. However, in a large systems, uh, there's uh, many um, resources. In, in uh, for example, the data store uh, has uh, several opportunities uh, in the local memory or. Uh, remote memory or device memory. So uh, resource allocator uh, ideally uh, yeah, choose the uh, um, optimal uh, resources uh, from the user workload. Um, 
So uh, ideally, uh, user uh, specifies uh, what kind of uh, features the workload has, and then uh, it gives a hint to the orchestrator, and the orchestrator chooses the um, uh, optimal server configuration. Uh, and uh, however, this is a uh, very complex problem, and uh, we need uh, new algorithms of, of the obsession and uh, uh, common API to support that. Thank you. So we are officially out of time, but maybe we can try one more. Just to basically anyone. So one question about how would you program such disaggregated systems? Or, or And maybe something to add on is that, is this something that you need to expose to all the way to application? I think you're going to wind up exposing it uh, personally. Um, you know, part of the, the question is, again, how are you thinking about the resource? Are you thinking about it as physical memory or, you know, um, we talked about MPI in Schmem. So Schmem, for example, is a symmetrically allocated memory. If somebody else was contributing a part of the memory into the symmetric allocation, you could access it, but there's no corresponding processing element that goes with it. So how do we expose the fact that there's in fact, a, a dumber region of memory with no bound process is what is going to be an interesting thing. And Satoshi said, you're then dealing perhaps with RDMA transfers to say, okay, I've got a remote resource. I need to bring it in rather than access it via, you know, say a pointer conversion into my local L2 cache. So I think it's going to have ramifications uh, into the programming stack for greatest efficiency. Um, most of the work here or people have been talking about is trying to to minimize that and to provide transparent uh, resource disaggregation. Okay. So, um, so Balogs, I wanted to address a few other questions that were uh, put into the chat regarding the slides. Uh, if you go to the uh, web, uh, if you go to the uh, uh, info session, we do have a website uh, for this panel, and we will be posting the slides to the extent we can on that. And in addition, for people who are asking about recording, we understand that SC is recording this session, so you'll be able to access the entire session uh, offline, uh, the, the recording of this session as well. But uh, you can find the link to our website for, uh, by going to the SC site, and the, the web link is there. Yes, and unfortunately, we are out of time here. So I think this is where we need to stop. We'd like to think, thank you all for the panelists and also for the audience for coming. And again, we will be putting the slides on the website. <laughs>